worlds intersect on each one I reflect These lines write my story These places change me Each one replacing Like night into morning I miss the open Welcome everyone, I am One True Brick, coming at you with an absolutely gigantic LEGO ExoForce review. Well, here we are. After reviewing every single set related to ExoForce over the course of almost a year now, we're going to be taking a look at the entire series. From 2006 to 2008, I'm going to be looking at every single set in this giant overview of the entire series. Apologies if there's some noise in the background. The only place that I really have space to show this all off is my driveway, and I live in a decently busy suburb, so please uh, pardon the sound of cars going by or a dog barking every now and again. And as cool as this overview wide shot of the entire series is, we're actually going to be taking a bit of a closer look here. I'm going to be moving my camera with me. 
because I want to give you guys a close-up of everything. One last thing that I realized I should probably do as I was unloading my last box of 2008 sets is I saw the books and realized I should probably throw these out too just to take a look at them. So if you guys didn't notice based off the uh, speed, I, I don't know if I should call it a build, speed setup at the beginning of this video, um, 2006 is decently bigger than the other waves. However, the amount of time it took me to set up this particular year was significantly longer than either of the other two. This one probably took me a good 20 to 25 minutes to set up everything. Meanwhile, these two I probably set up together in the span of about 10 minutes. And I wanted to quick mention something as I was setting these all up together. It really put into perspective some of the um, flaws and strengths that I've talked about over the course of all of my reviews. Most notably, the fragility of the 2006 sets. Now, granted, these sets have been in storage the longest. I started out doing these at the beginning of the year, whereas when I'm going over these, uh, it's been pretty recent. However, almost every single one of these sets, as I was setting it up, had some piece fall off or had already fallen off in the box, and it really took uh, a lot of effort just to get them to stay together. The wind was also blowing through, so every now and again a set would get knocked over, and these sets were the ones that kept getting knocked over the most. So it really does put into perspective how strong the later years were. I'm not sure if LEGO got complaints or if the designers took all of the previous year's sets and just really observed them and, and uh, decided on what really needed to be fixed. But um, the major thing that I noticed in later years was the strength of the... Um, stability of all these sets. You can see there's uh, a lot better build in the legs and in the smaller parts up top. I think the only thing that really uh, remained that was fragile was uh, some of the structural builds like the um, Sentai Golden Tower and maybe some of the larger builds like the Combat Crawler, but quite honestly the Technic core that they implemented really did strengthen how well built everything was with typical lego if you are just building with system parts when you put them together you're stacking in one direction and so everything can break in one direction all you have to do is uh put force on one side uh whether it be the side or the top depending on which direction you're building and everything will break whereas with technic um you have the ability to go in multiple directions very easily and build kind of this tight core and I really think that the later years really uh, benefited from the introduction of more Technic within the build. Something else that I noticed, thanks to Bionicle parts implementation in later years, specifically with the socket, uh, ball and socket joints, is that there is a lot better posability. I noticed when I was setting up this last uh, wave, it was so much easier to get them to stand up the way I wanted to. Because my driveway is tilted slightly downwards, I had to position the um, center of gravity a little bit higher. So you'll notice some of these sets over here are tilted slightly up so that they don't fall forward. But with these sets, it was like I just set them down, tilted the feet slightly, and the center of gravity was completely shifted because I have so many... Um, different positions. With a ball and socket joint, you can go right down to the exact degree that you want. Whereas with the older uh, ratcheting joints, you don't really get as much of that uh, flexibility. Uh, the one downside to that, I don't really think these sets particularly um, suffer from this because they use a combination of ratchet and ball joints. Um, the ratchet joints are a little bit stronger. They tend to stay up a little bit better, whereas the ball joints, because of their more uh, high amount of mobility, uh, unfortunately, they do have a tendency to fall over a little bit more um, because the, the it can't support as much weight. But because most of the sets that the um, ball joints are in uh, are small, like these ones down here, they don't really suffer from this issue all that much. There's not a whole lot of weight being put into it. The only set that I really noticed that there was uh, a lot of weight on that could potentially fall over was the uh, Chameleon Hunter. 
And oddly enough, even though it's about the same number of pieces as the Assault Tiger, I think the weight distribution is much more geared towards the top of the set than the bottom. And then, of course, there were uh, a few other sets like the Jungle Thrasher that gave me a little bit of difficulty, but that was primarily, I believe, because the set wasn't fully finished or perhaps wasn't fully entirely correctly built. I do still think the base of those legs might have uh, intended to have a, an entire axle go through them. But yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at all the sets as a whole. Um, so 2006 started off with this very anime-based mecha style with lots of colors, very reminiscent of Gundam. And they designed most of their first wave, like the Grand Titan and Stealth Hunter, off of that. You can very much tell the inspiration that comes from it. And then as we shifted into further years, the um, Golden City is a lot more reminiscent of ancient Japanese style of architecture and build. Uh, even though it is still all Japanese based, they come from different eras. Uh, the Gundam-like design of the 2006 wave is primarily more based off what you'd expect from a um, fantasy uh, postmodern setting. This one is based off more of ancient Japanese architecture. And finally, the Deep Jungle era is a hard one to peg. Obviously, they're all based off of animals, and uh, there is a lot of uh, animal influence in Japanese folklore and uh, design, so there there is definitely a correlation there, though it doesn't feel like it fits in quite as much as the other two. Um, but I still absolutely love it. And uh, as I reviewed these series, uh, 2006 was generally my favorite. But as I uh, continued going over the different sets, I really did come to appreciate the final wave. And I actually think wave five, the, even though it didn't have nearly as many sets, really perfected the design of the uh, Exo Force series. There were only maybe one or two sets where I was like, you know, this isn't the greatest. I really absolutely loved both of the human battle machines, the bipedal ones. Uh, the two smaller sets were some of the best ones we've ever gotten, especially the Arachnoid Stalker. Uh, its design is completely unique for an $8 build, and you really get tons of features packed into a set that Nowadays, if you were to buy an $8 or $10 set, you really wouldn't get that much in the box. And then the Dark Panther really stands out to me as being a great, uh, just overall, just great set because it has so many figures and functions built into it for a $15 set. Uh, I really appreciate how this feels like it could actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a human battle machine. In a, a lot of the earlier years, the humans really struggled in their first battle or two against a, a Fire Vulture or a Thunder Fury, but once they figured out their weakness, they really didn't have much of a challenge against them, because there really is only one robot, one threat attacking them. With the Dark Panther, on the other hand, it feels like there's so many overwhelming attacks coming at one human battle machine at once that they couldn't help but get overwhelmed. Um, and then, of course, I do appreciate the two larger sets. The Hybrid Rescue Tank is, um, once again, a great $30 set, but it really does have a lot of competition uh, between the medium-sized sets, the Golden Guardian, Aero Booster, and the um, two sets from over here, the Mobile Defense Tank and the Gate Assault set. All are really great examples of what you can do with around three to 400 parts. And it really creates this really beefy, bulky uh, setup. And I, I personally think that the 30, 25 to $30 sets are some of the best amongst all of the ExoForce series. So hopping back to 2006, uh, the story's character growth throughout it. Um, the first year really started off focus on Hikaru and Takeshi. They really embodied two completely different characters, and I, I hate to say they are a little bit on the generic side. Um, they're definitely taking cues from Bionicles, two characters uh, of Kopaka and Tahu. Takeshi is the hot-headed, uh, kind of, I'm in charge, uh, kind of character where he just rushes into battle without much uh, thought put into how he's going to win. He just assumes that because 
his battle machine is so powerful that he absolutely is going to be victorious, which, to be fair, he often is. Whereas Hikaru is the more cold and calculating solo type. He doesn't really like working with others. He prefers to go in his stealth hunter, go into stealth mode, and kind of pick off enemies one by one, almost like a, a hunter or a, or a sniper within the military. And really uh, kind of lines up with Kopaka's character of being kind of icy cold. But later on in the year, there were uh, a few other characters introduced. Hayato does have a brief amount of story in the first year. He is, uh, I would say, if we're, we're still comparing to uh, characters that are within the Bionicle storyline, he's probably a lot like Lua. He loves flying. He doesn't really have much care for if he gets hurt, but he isn't quite as aggressive as Takeshi is. He's definitely... Uh, a little bit more reckless like Takeshi, but doesn't get as angry as often. He's more fun-loving and uh, enjoys being up in the sky and being able to shoot stuff from uh, so high up. But the third character that really got a huge focus in the second half of the year was Ryo. So Ryo's a techie. So Ryo's character really got a lot more development than any of the other characters uh, in that he really developed this personality of becoming attached to the battle machines that he worked on and designed. In particular, Uplink's battle machine was really special to him. He had developed various different parts of it over the course of his time uh, at Exoforce. It's not really super clear if he designed it from scratch or if he modified it from a repair battle machine that was already designed. But over the course of the second half of the year, he really makes a large effort to rescue Uplink, who gets captured by the robots. And this really shows us Ryo's ingenuity in creating battle machines that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the robot battle machines. Sure, we've got Hikaru and Takeshi, who are really amazing fighters, and uh, various other members of Exoforce that aren't really ever uh, talked about or named. But Ryo really is the core of what helps them to defeat the robots. He's the one who's always got the plan for how to go up against one or more of the robot battle machines. He's the one who figured out that the uh, core of the robot battle machine could be ejected by hitting uh, this little antenna. It's their exhaust, and without it, the battle machine overheats. He's the one who de designed the mobile defense tank, specifically with the idea in mind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Sonic Phantom, which up until then had been a really dangerous battle machine that the robots had. And if you think about it, uh, the Sonic Phantom was designed by Yukio, Takeshi's father, who at the time was probably the most uh, well-renowned scientist of Exoforce. And so the idea that to, uh, Ryo, who was effectively a kid, I believe the story shows him to be 17 at the beginning of the storyline and working his way up to 18 or 19 by the end. It's really incredible to see that he had the ingenuity to create something that could take down uh, a robot battle machine that was so creatively designed. So there are a few other points in the story that are notable. Um, there was the battle against the Bridgewalker, uh, flown by, um, or piloted by Mecha One. This was really notable because it was the, uh, it was right after the point where uh, Rio was rescued from the robot base, and they believed that they had killed Mecha One um, when he was piloting the robot battle machine here, Venom 1, and they thought he was dead. And when he showed up again in the Bridgewalker, uh, this was the first time that the humans realized that Mech 1 had the ability to reproduce, not just build more mindless iron drones or even the slightly more intelligent Devastators, but full-on copies of himself that were unaware of the fact that they weren't the real Mecha 1. Um... Finally, at the end of the year, uh, there was the largest battle Exoforce had ever faced and the largest battle ever laid out in the comics, which was the uh, Striking Venom battle, led by the real version 
of Mecha 1 and the largest force of robot battle machines ever. Now this story is laid out in the second book. Um, if you guys are wondering why I didn't do a reading of this, it is because the story is laid out in the comics and I want to primarily cover audiobooks of the books that are going to be more difficult for you to obtain particularly books one, four, and five, don't have their stories laid out in the comics. They're not duplicated. Now, there is a little bit more detail given in books two and three of the various stories that they cover, uh, but quite honestly, you can get away with reading the comics. And so I decided to skip those, also because Exoforce isn't quite as popular as Bionicle, sadly. So I wanted to take the time to specifically cover these stories that... Uh, you guys probably won't have access to. So that pretty much wraps up 2006. I think it was a great start to Exoforce and really uh, gave a great launching point for the characters. Um, it has some fantastic sets. Uh, I've talked about before how the $30 sets are some of my favorite. The Bridgewalker versus White Lightning is also a fantastic set. I think it's far better than the Striking Venom in that it is a lot more sturdy aside from a few antennas here and there it holds up a lot better being stored and uh, stood up it also personally to me looks a lot more intimidating the fact that it's on two legs instead of four really uh, adds to its bulk and uh, the grand titan is also a wonderful 15 dollars set probably um, one of my favorites across the series. So those sets are some of my favorites. If you would like actual recommendations for which sets you should buy if you're new to Exoforce, be sure to check out some of my earlier videos, specifically the one where I cover the 2006 storyline. Moving on to 2007, this was an interesting middle ground for Exoforce. Most people consider this to be the weakest year and depends on what perspective you're looking at it from. Um, I definitely think it had its weak points. Uh, most notably, the design of the human battle machines was rather bland throughout the course of the series. Uh, the Grand Titan, or uh, sorry, the Blade Titan, the Sky Guardian, the Golden Guardian, and the Blazing Falcon all had pretty much the same build to them. So did the Cyclone Defender Claw Crusher and the front of the Aero Booster, but the Aero Booster really uh, gave a, a new spin on the set, so I, I don't blame it quite as much. But the robots definitely had far more creative designs. The Shadow Crawler was the first time they had a $15 set that wasn't bipedal, and I really appreciate the creativity that goes into the set. And even the Iron Condor really had a lot of creativity. Even though the leg design was similar to other sets, it had posable torso, it had a claw hand, it had a lot more movability in the arms, and then the torso build, as well as the wings, really gave it a unique appearance. Well, it is probably my... Uh, it is, it's probably the weakest of the robot battle machines. That is... Uh, not saying much because I think every single one of the robot battle machines really had a creative build, even if certain ones didn't work out as well as others, um, most notably the Combat Crawler X2. I really appreciated the fact that they had the dual functionality, but this set really felt incomplete. Once again, they had the same flaw as the Striking Venom in that uh, the legs didn't really have a whole lot of ability to move, and it really took away from any playability that you could have had with the set. Uh, on top of that, um, the core build looks really unfinished, and uh, I wasn't a big fan of that. I wish they had added at least one more minifigure and kind of finished up the area in there, because you can see a lot of exposed bricks that, you know, don't really seem to have much of a purpose there. The Golden City Era's storyline is really where I think it personally falls short. Um, the first half of the year really did have a lot of story, and they had more books than any other year. So we've got books three, four, and five, as well as a couple of collector's guides. So this one's more of a puzzle book, and then this one was a collector's guide that went over a lot of the story aspects of the uh, Exo Force timeline. So there was definitely a lot more story content within the books for the 
second year of Exoforce. Unfortunately, the comics were not similar in that aspect. The first year got a total of 26 comics covering the entire story and a lot of really developmental storylines for the characters. Um, unfortunately, with the Golden City era, the first book kind of covers a good majority of the comics. Um, they spend a, a lot of comics focusing on the discovery of the Golden City and not really a whole lot after that of the major battle and conflict between the humans and robots. I believe this was because at the time Exoforce had probably already been cancelled. Uh, Lego tends to work one to two years ahead and so they were probably already getting into designing the sets for the Deep Jungle era. Lego was prepared to release them, uh, but they started cutting funding on some of the more story-based aspects because the theme had been canceled at this point. So in the second half, we got a really shoddy uh, idea of um, a, a battle. There was a little bit of character development for two characters that we hadn't seen a whole lot of before, and I really appreciated this, that being Hayato and Hitami. Um, they got the majority of the middle portion of the uh, comics for the Golden City era, as well as a lot of development within these two books, uh, Hayato being primary character in The Ghost of the Past, and Race for the Golden City primarily focusing on Hitami and really developing their characters. And I really did appreciate that. There were a lot more sets that included um, Ryo and Hayato than the past years, which is appreciated but once again I, I do wish Hitami had been included in more sets because her character really did get focused on a lot in that year and I really think she would have fit perfectly into the Blazing Falcon which ended up being her battle machine for the final year. I also just realized there's a piece missing from uh, the Blazing Falcon which probably means it's somewhere Oh well. Hopefully it's not gone, but uh, I'll find it later. So, Golden City Era had kind of a weak ending to it with its story, um, but not nearly as weak as the sad ending that was the Deep Jungle Era. The Deep Jungle Era had absolutely phenomenal sets, as I talked about at the beginning of this video, and I really liked pretty much all of them. The only one that I didn't really like as much was the Storm Lasher, and that's because of its repetitive build. It doesn't look bad in the end, but it's not that fun to build the actual set. However, the story was severely lacking. At, at this point, Exoforce had all been but ended, and uh, they released their final wave but didn't really have much of a story. There were absolutely no books released. There were supposed to be um, a sixth book called um, Jungle of Fear, I believe, something along those lines. Um, but it was never released. It was supposed to be penned by Greg Farshti. I wish I had been able to get my hands on a copy of the book. Um, but sadly, I was not able to. He was not willing to uh, show off what he had written. And we only got one single comic for the ending that uh, just barely introduced the story. Uh, it shows the humans entering the deep jungle and uh, facing off against some of the robots. But that's where the story ends. Um, the storyline uh, was a continuation of the 2007 one, and I just found the piece. And I'll uh, quick talk to you guys about that. The 2007 storyline uh, focused on the Golden City, and within the Golden City there was a computer that contained lots of information that was locked up by codes. And what the robots did is they created a more human-like version of Mecha One to infiltrate the human's base and pretend to be Sensei Kiken. And they actually kidnapped him and swapped him out for the double, which is some really cool two Terminator stuff going on there. Um, but I really appreciated the fact that they uh, implemented that aspect of the story. It was a plot twist that I did not expect to see coming. Uh, until the comic where they revealed it. 
However, upon this discovery, they realized, well, if this robot's here with Sensei Kikin, he's been kidnapped and taken to the deep jungle. And I find it interesting that the deep jungle focuses on something that is not at all related to the mountain itself. The first two years really were focused on uh, working their way up the mountain. The first uh, set of uh, stories really focused around the middle portion of the uh, Sentai Mountain. And then working their way up to the top uh, or very near to the top with the Golden City. Not quite at the top. But the deep jungle is actually at the base of the mountain and not really uh, having anything to do with the mountain, which makes me wonder if there was supposed to be a point at the end where they had to make a mad rush back to the top of the mountain to um, stop some horrible event from occurring, like the destruction of the whole human side. But I think that pretty much wraps up everything I have to say. Um, Exoforce has been a passion of mine since it came out. Uh, it's quite funny. My um, my first introduction to the series was looking at a uh, Lego uh, magazine back when Brickmaster was a lot more popular. And they showed uh, this really anime-esque version of the Stealth Hunter. And I took one look at it and I was like, this is going to be dumb. And then just a mere like month later, I bought the Grand Titan and continued buying sets until I had every single one of them. And uh, I bought every single set when the series was out. Uh, it actually took a big chunk out of my savings towards Bionicle sets. I typically would save up enough to purchase every single Bionicle set. And I really did buy every single 2005 Bionicle set when it came out. Uh, but 2006, 2007 were really years where I didn't have enough money to buy every single set and had to go back and buy Bionicle sets later on. Um, 2008, not so much. There weren't that many sets, and uh, actually a lot of them got discounted. I remember getting pretty much all the Deep Jungle sets for about 20 to 30% off uh, when it was only, I think, two or three weeks after they'd come out. I bought them before the year ended. It was 2007 in December, and I had gone to both Legoland and Toys R Us, and I got uh, every single set um, for less than they were supposed to launch for, which really shows how much they were trying to can the series, which is pretty sad. But throughout the course of the storyline, it was really quite incredible. I, to this day, uh, consider it to be one of the best Lego themes. I personally hold more... Um, feelings towards it than I do Bionicle. I know a lot of people, Bionicle is their number one story-based theme. Um, but Exo Force really was a great introduction to Japanese culture for me, um, albeit not the most accurate depiction of it. Uh, but it ended up getting me into the uh, style of uh, storytelling that they had and really made me like anime in the end. Uh, a few years later, I found myself watching shows like Gundam, and Code Geass and a bunch of others. So if you are looking for your ExoForce fix, um, feel free to check out those shows. Um, obviously, it's not going to be the same, but definitely show, shares a lot of similarities. And uh, there are Gundam model kits, which I found are very fun to build and in a way a more mature version of ExoForce. So keep that in mind if you are still looking to get some ExoForce fix and you have every single set or every single one that you're interested in. So with that, I just wanted to say um, at some point down the line, I would like to write some sort of story that ends ExoForce. I'm sure there have been lots of people who have tried to do it before, but over the course of the years that I've owned these sets and, and followed the storyline, I really wish it had gotten a better ending. And uh, I think it was very close to getting a good ending, um, but unfortunately... Uh, because of the nature of the way LEGO works, they had to can it before it was finished. Uh, a lot of LEGO themes don't end up getting a uh, true ending, but because this one was so story-focused, they really had to cut it off in a way that was um, not super fun. And uh, I wish they had done it better. So, 
I would like to someday be able to write an ending myself. Uh, that might happen in six months. It might be a year. It might be five years. It might be 10. Um, but at some point down the line, I'd like to get together uh, a team of writers, a team of artists to put together a final comic or a final book that really wraps up the storyline and uh, gives it the ending it deserved. So with that, I thank you guys for joining me for this final video of ExoForce, and uh, I will see you guys at some point in the future. Thanks! Bye! Air Booster's best set! Bye!